The teaching that I would like to give this morning is actually a teaching that is appropriate for older practicing Buddhists and for those that do not yet practice Buddhism or are just becoming involved or new practitioners. And that teaching is on something that uh, Buddhists in the Vajrayana tradition call Samaya. Samaya refers to commitment. It actually refers to making a promise. And in the Vajrayana tradition, Samaya takes many different forms. There are certain kinds of teachings for which one must make a commitment in order to receive that teaching. Uh, in our tradition, we have something called empowerment, we have commentary teaching, and we have wind transmission, or lung, which is a breath transmission. These two uh, very, very essential components of the teaching, these three rather, very essential components of the teaching, must be given in a certain way. And one of the, um, one of the uh, methods that one employs in order to be receptive to the teaching and in order to benefit from the teaching is to make commitment or to make samaya. One cannot actually receive any kind of empowerment without creating uh, the, 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 the vehicle for the transmission of that empowerment through samaya. Samaya is necessary to create the vehicle for that transmission. If there is no samaya, if there is no promise, there is no transmission. Literally, the lama or teacher could give the, give the transmission and give the transmission and give the transmission using, using all of the ritual implements and all of uh, his or her own enlightened purpose. <clears throat> and if there is no commitment and no samaya, there is no, com there is no uh, transmission. Not, it does not occur. It's um, very much like throwing <coughs> seeds on cement. They will simply not take root. That is the case. But the word samaya trips us up. The word commitment trips us up. First of all, because we have grown up with the idea and we have absorbed the idea that at all costs, at all costs, we should remain something like rugged individualists. You know, that we should uh, be, the way we think of this as is that we should be free thinkers. This is how we think of it. It isn't necessarily the case, but it's how we think of it. It reminds me a little bit of the 60s, actually, where people would dress a certain way in order to demonstrate their response to society, that they were not responding to society in a way, they were not buckling down, they were not um, uh, you know, getting in the, in, the, in the groove and marching with everyone else in the same way that everyone else marched. So in order to demonstrate that, we wore different kinds of clothing. And we had different kinds of attitudes and different kinds of speech manifestations, you know, um, that we would use, that, everybody, that would signify our difference. But in fact, interestingly enough, it was very plain to see that pretty soon we were wearing the uniforms. And we were adapting the speech that signified us to be in a certain group, and therefore we're no longer free thinkers. That became obvious to many of us, and therefore many of us went on to integrate whatever was good of that time into our lives and drop some of the outward manifestations. In the same way, um, we as free thinkers tend to be so fixed in that idea and so stubborn in that free thinkingness that we are extremely bound and extremely limited. And being, ex being extremely limited, um, there's not much capacity. The, the mind is too hard, hard like a rock or hard like horn, uh, the teaching tells us. It's too hard to actually absorb the teaching. It's very similar, forgive me for using this example of the 60s, but it's one that I'm, I'm, I'm acquainted with. Um, it's very similar to the idea that people in the 60s would wear a certain kind of clothing and would automatically alienate themselves from other aspects of life. That they would automatically do that. And in doing that, there was some 
intimacies and familiarities and opennesses that we could not have simply because of the distinction that we ourselves created, the holding back that we ourselves did. And likewise, those of us that, that hold the idea of being a free thinker, you know, I am, I'm completely unimpressed with uh, formal thinking regimes or formal theoretical uh, platforms. I am completely unimpressed with that. I'll take a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there and a little bit there. The hardness that we have in our mind, the uniform that we don in our own mind, causes us to be incapacitated, really, unable to hear <clears throat> some element of subtlety, some element of truth that empowers us to absorb the teaching deeply. And it basically rolls right off our back. We just don't get it. And of course, not getting it seems to make us feel justified. If we don't get it, then we can say there's nothing there and we continue to be a free thinker. But, and that may, may be the case. That may be the case. Maybe there's, you're listening to a teaching in which there's nothing there. That's possible. <clears throat> but if, like the person of the 60s, you are automatically alienated from some kinds of experiences, you will never know. Therefore, you're not such a free thinker. You just don't know. Much better to admit that you just don't know. Much better to take a chance, take off the uniform, try it for a period of time, knowing that you can put your uniform back on if you want to, so that you can have that experience. Much better to gentle the mind and allow the mind to be in a place of depth so that it can absorb something deeper of the teaching. That's really a much better method. <coughs> Otherwise, you really just don't know. Well, back to the idea of Samaya. With the idea of Samaya, that in order to, to take a teaching on the Buddhist path, one has to form a certain level of commitment with this teaching. Now this level of commitment is not like buying into a club. It's not like you buy a ticket to Club Med or then you're a member or maybe Holiday Spa or something like that and then you're a member. It's not like that where you pay your dues and you're in. It isn't like that at all. What it is actually is that there are certain elements of one's life, the structure of one's life, that one examines and comes to certain conclusions. With the beginning steps of entering into the Buddhist path, one should first of all, from a logical point of view, examine one's own life. Not asking you to get a psychic reading and find out what your past lives are, not asking you to guess or take a flying leap at what brought you here to this moment, but the request is to examine your life as you know it and remember it up until this point. From that point of view, you will easily discover that you have tried very hard to get where you are today, that you've worked quite hard. Well, some of you might say, I've had a lot of it handed to me. I've, I've heard people say that. But in fact, if you really examine, every day you work very hard, and, and in your way, your efforts are noble and conscientious. One thing we know for sure, you're extremely busy. You must be doing something. You've got to be working hard somewhere. You are working hard. If you examine the course of your life, you should be able to see what exactly you've been working hard at. We have lots of different things we work hard at. We work hard at our jobs and our families and our relationships and our money situations and our living situations, different kinds of situations like that. We really take them into hand and really work very hard with them. And if we examine those particular kinds of things, we will discover that each one of those things that we've worked very hard at 
is something that, to use the old adage, you can't take it with you. Each one of those things that we have worked very hard at are things that bring some temporary success and perhaps some temporary happiness, but in fact are things that, at the time of our death, will have no real value. These are things that a Buddhist would examine. Now, even if we spend the greater emphasis of our lives on our internal experience, that is to say, our emotional experience, our intellectual experience, about which we are so ever, ever, ever so proud, our, our, even our intuitive experience, whatever subtle inner experiences that we have, including our inner guidance and all that stuff. If we really examine tho those particular phenomena, they are actually phenomena that are brought about through the thinking process, through the determination of what self is all about and what other is all about, through the belief in self-nature as being inherently <coughs> real, and the belief is in other as being distinct from self-nature, through some ideas that come about through our material experience. And that these very ideas, due to the fact that they come about through the five senses, actually, originally, and through our material experience, at the time of death, will also have no context, no meaning, and cannot be continued. Because that portion of ourselves that has even intuitive experience, even that subtle, or emotional experience, and certainly intellectual experience, will cease to exist in that way. So the Buddhist examines and sees that most of what we've been doing up until this time is short-term benefit, brings a 50-50 chance of good result, that is to say it brings some happiness and brings some disappointment, You've worked very hard and been disappointed. You know what I'm talking about. You've worked very hard to, to engineer some kind of internal experience that was ultimately very disappointing. You know what I'm talking about. So it's 50-50, pretty chancy. And this is what the Buddhist examines. Mm -hmm. Then the Buddhist examines that those who have achieved enlightenment, those who are themselves Buddhas, not just one historical Buddha, but everyone who has shown definite signs of achieving realization, has therefore come in some form or returned in some form or left some message, some footprint in the sand, if you will, left some message that there is a nature that is pure, that is undefiled, that is the primordial wisdom nature, that is our true nature. This is the message that we get consistently time and time again from those who have achieved enlightenment. That <coughs> that nature is beginningless, spontaneously arising, evidently always complete, and has no cessation because it has no beginning. It is free of that kind of time constraint. So that that nature is separate from the continuum of birth and death. That nature is the true underlying primordial wisdom state, and that each of us is, in fact, that nature. Yet we spend all of our time, all of our experience, polishing up this continuum thing, polishing up whatever experience we can have between the time of birth and death which is a very short space of time when you're considering that according to the Buddhist teachings, we have lived even so far since time out of mind. We're talking aeons and aeons of cyclic existence. So even if you're talking in terms of continuum, the continuum that we've put so much investment in in this lifetime is very, very short. But we, we hold nothing, no no importance, really, no focus on, no taste of that primordial wisdom nature, which is the true nature. We do not awaken to that nature. 
We do not experience that nature. We do not move toward purifying our perception so that we can have direct perception of that nature. We do very little in terms of how much time we actually have. And even if we are practitioners, even if we practice for a couple of hours a day, we haven't been doing that for so long, really. We've lived longer than that. And if your day consists of 24 hours and you don't hit your two-hour mark every single day, what portion of your day do you actually use to cultivate what is true, to cultivate a true perception? (coughs) The idea of samaya comes from examining these things. The idea of commitment comes from examining these things and seeing that, as the Buddha has instructed, all cyclic existence, which is the birth and death experience, is filled with suffering. And that suffering primarily occurs in the form of disappointment. In the form of disappointment, in the, por- in the form of the suffering of suffering, in the, point, in the form of uh, the, the impermanence and lack of predictability of cyclic existence in that right now we're happy and alive and well and feeling pretty good, but we really have no idea whether or not we will live out the week. I mean, really, we have no such idea. So the Buddha teaches us that that kind of suffering does exist. But the Buddha also teaches us that there is a cessation of suffering. There is an end to suffering. And that end to suffering is called enlightenment. That end to suffering is reached when one awakens to the primordial wisdom nature. And in that nature, there is no building block for suffering. There is nothing of which to make suffering. That nature in its uncontrived, pure luminosity is free of hatred, greed, and ignorance. Therefore, there is no suffering. It's free of desire. Therefore, there is no suffering. So examining all of those things, we decide, therefore, to practice renunciation as concerns cyclic existence. And from that point on, to move toward, to move through the door of enlightenment. Basically, that is samaya, that is commitment. Now it takes many forms. Uh, When you actually take empowerment, you promise to have, for instance, if you are receiving an empowerment having to do with a certain deity, uh, that is to say a certain Buddha essence or emanation of the Buddha, uh, if one is uh, taking an empowerment for Chen Rezi or Avalokiteshvara, which is the, uh, the Buddha associated with Om Mani Padme Hum, that particular mantra. If one were to take an empowerment having to do with that deity, one would actually practice in such a way during the course of the empowerment by saying, I have made samaya or commitment with that deity, I will never abandon that deity, I will practice that my nature is the same as that deity. I will come to know my nature as being the same as that deity. Well, now the way we think is kind of goofy because we think, well, wait a minute now, is that the deity I want to make a commitment with? We think we're like getting married or something, you know. <laughs> and this is like, um, uh, what do you call it, the computer dating system, you know. <laughs> and maybe Chen Reze is not the man for us. <clears throat> I don't think that that's the point, you see. Um, the point is that Chen Reze's nature is an emanation of the fully enlightened state. And what we are actually promising at that point is to never abandon the intent, the directive, and the activity of awakening to that same fully enlightened state so that we realize our nature to be non-dual with Chen Rezi. In the same regard, when we begin to take teachings in such a way as to take them consistently, and when we form a relationship with a teacher, if that teacher is the one that has hooked us to the path and brought us into the path and reveals to us something of our own mind. That teacher is called the root guru. You can have more than one root guru, that's for sure. Any teacher that demonstrates to you something of your mind, reveals to you 
in a mirror-like fashion something of your mind. That teacher is your root guru. And like, and consequently, you form a samaya or a relationship with the root guru. Now, does that mean that um, it's like choosing a boyfriend or a girlfriend that means that you have to be um, faithful, you know, in the same way that uh, you would be, hopefully, to a husband or wife or to a boyfriend or girlfriend? No, it, it, it's not like that at all. Not in that superficial sense. But in the truest, deepest sense, absolutely. That's exactly what it means. But what is that true and deep sense? That true and deep sense is this, that when you meet with someone that you are calling your root guru, you have embarked upon the path. <clears throat> you have met someone who can benefit you in such a way as to help you walk through the door of liberation. In a sense, then, that root guru becomes for you the very door of liberation. Ultimately, through the blessing from that teacher, you will achieve enlightenment. You will achieve enlightenment. And at that stage, the primordial wisdom nature in seed form, that is your Buddha nature, will be fully realized. You will abide spontaneously and effortlessly in that nature. <clears throat> the path that you have utilized in order to practice, in order to achieve that realization, will be fully revealed to you. And it will be understood as the very display or dance of your own primordial wisdom nature. The root guru then is understood to be inseparable from one's own nature, to be an actual display of the Buddha nature in such a form as to confront the rigidity of our egos. And so the teacher becomes the same and as precious as one's own Buddha nature. <coughs> For us then, the root guru becomes like the Buddha nature, the same as. And we practice in such a way as to understand that when we see the root guru, we are in fact seeing our own face. It is not separate. It is not separate. That samaya is maintained through some effortfulness, because in the beginning it's very difficult. In the beginning the brain wants to play around. The brain wants to say, well, let's see, should I have chocolate or vanilla? You know, should I think this way or that way? Or what's the game plan here? And do I like this? And there's all kinds of different ideas and, and rigidities, stiffnesses that come up. But we should really recognize them as the movement or dance or display of our own ego nature. And with a little practice, we can learn to just pass it off. We can understand also that through, through some effortfulness, we can understand that it isn't easy to approach the path with a mind of duality and expect to see one's path, expect to see one's root guru, expect to see one's meditational deity that, that one practices, expect to see those as indistinguishable from one's own nature. We have been practicing duality since time out of mind. It's very difficult to lose. And it takes some effort. But that effort is called samaya. There is commitment. The mistake that practitioners make is that they wait for the big feeling. They wait for the undeniable, bone-crushing, emotional, intuitive mind-blowing experience that will tell them, this is it. And I know of people that have had that experience, and they are not necessarily practicing whatever it was they experienced, because it's just another one of those things. <coughs> During the course of your life, if you're that kind of person, you will have that kind of experience. And you must understand that it is connected more with your ego than anything else that it is simply something you do. That it is a manifestation of things that you cook up in your own mind through your own five senses and your own mental inflammation.
that actual, actually when one keeps samaya, one does so through some effort, through intelligent and logical decision, through examining one's life and through examining the path, the method, through examining the, the truth of the teaching that the Buddha nature does in fact exist and that it is the state which is free of suffering. And through examining that, one understands that one must travel this path, a path. And it is that that is the, the fertile ground or the birthing ground for true <coughs> samaya. What is the underlying truth of samaya? The, tr- the underlying truth of samaya or commitment is realizing that one has the nugget or seed that is the Buddha nature. That one has that nugget or seed. That that is in fact the truth of one's nature. It's undeniable that the natural state is that innately wakeful, primordial wisdom state. Not dead and cold and empty, but innately wakeful, luminous. Aware, but in a non-specific and general way. But a true and luminous awareness that that is the primordial wisdom nature. That is the Buddha nature. And realizing that that nature occurs within every single sentient being in seed form. One should no longer abandon that nature, but hold it as the most precious jewel. Now, as a Buddhist, of course, we think like that, and we think that we're doing that, and we do prayers every day, and we think we're holding it as the most precious jewel. But do we? Don't we really give more credence to the perception of our five senses? Don't we really give more credence to our own intellectual process? Don't you love your insights? Don't you love the ideas that you come up with? Don't you love all that fabricated stuff that you have rolling around in your head and on your tongue? You do, because I hear it. We love all that stuff so much more. And we constantly and consistently abandon our own Buddha nature. Abandon it. So from that point of view, we break Samaya every moment that we do not awaken to the primordial wisdom state. Every moment that we continue to exist in the mind of duality that commitment, that samaya, that we have made and should make to our own nature, we have broken. Therefore, from the point of view of a Buddhist practitioner, we've also broken samaya with the Buddha, with the Dharma, with the Sangha, with the Lama, with the meditational deity, with the Dakini. Broken it all because we forget. Therefore, the Buddha has revealed to us a technology <clears throat> of receiving empowerment from the meditation from the from the guru who gives us the empowerment of the meditational deity and promising to keep the practice promising to keep that commitment of realizing one's nature as being the same as the nature of the meditational deity and practicing accordingly that is actually a technology to help us remember to wake up if you think about it and We are taught also to keep the Samaya with our own root guru. I mean, someone that was in a very superficial place might think that was because the guru needs the extra attention. Trust me, that is not the case. In truth, the student needs that inner posture. That inner posture is to remind one of the preciousness of the seed of our own Buddhahood, the preciousness of the path, the preciousness of the goal, which is supreme enlightenment. And we practice accordingly with the administrator of those three components, the one who delivers the seed into fruition, the one who, who leads us on the path, and the one who helps us to walk through the door and provides the door of liberation. We practice the technology of respect and commitment and devotion 
in order to awaken ourselves, really. <coughs> that, is, that is the method. The basis for any samaya, remember, is to hold the seed of enlightenment as the most precious jewel, the most precious jewel, that there is nothing else so precious, to remind us to not get caught up in discursive thought, which we are now, even as I speak. To not be caught up in erroneous perception or the mind of duality. The Samaya is for that purpose, to hold, to hold the mind of enlightenment in the most precious place and never abandon it. That is the purpose of Samaya. Now what happens is when you get into practicing, you'll hear that since you've received this empowerment, you have Samaya with this deity, then you receive another empowerment, you have Samaya with another deity, then you receive another empowerment and you have Samaya with another deity, and then you get your three roots practices and you have Samaya with the three roots, and then you have three or four teachers that come to the center, and you have Samaya with all of them, and you're sitting there trying to make a grocery list, <laughs> and, and you have like anxiety attacks, you know, <laughs> <laughs> breathing problems, and you think maybe that you're really blowing it big time. But you must understand the root of Samaya in order underst to understand how to keep Samaya. The root of Samaya is to hold the jewel of the nature in a place where you do not abandon it. That is the root of Samaya. All the meditational deities have the same nature. Whichever one you practice, whether it be Chen Rezik or Amitabha or the Three Roots or whatever it happens to be, that is holding the precious jewel of Buddha nature in the most elevated place. That is what you're doing when you do that. When you hold the root guru in a place of regard, you should not think of this root guru and that root guru and this root guru and that root guru. And this one's better and this one's higher and that one's this one and that one's that one. That's just, that's, that's breaking Samaya. That is breaking Samaya. But instead, you should understand that what you are doing is holding the primordial wisdom nature in the most elevated place. The thing of value is that which provides the method by which we can walk through the door of liberation. And that door of liberation, once walked through, will display to us nothing other than our own face, our own nature. But method must be employed. Technology must be employed. Otherwise, we'll continue to do what we have been doing, which has not produced the result of enlightenment. So, understand then that the holding of Samaya is a very deep and very personal thing. And as you study your mind and come to know the meaning of Samaya through realizing the faults of cyclic existence and realizing the, the benefit of awakening to the primordial wisdom state to realize the preciousness of the Buddha nature, upon realizing that, you will become adept at understanding whether or not you are keeping Samaya, and only you will know that. Only you will know that. In the meantime, you can ask yourself, do you practice in such a way as to realize your own nature? Do you practice in such a way as to realize your nature as being inseparable from these primordial wisdom Buddhas that we are taught about? You can say mantras all day long and still not be doing that. Do you realize that? Do you practice in such a way as to realize the nature? Is that the point? And when you hold a certain teacher as your root guru and you go through all the fanciness of prostrations or making offerings or coming for advice or just coming for teachings or whatever it is that, that we do, standing up when the teacher ent enters the room or whatever, that kind of thing. Do you intend to utilize that teacher as a means by which you yourself will see your own face? Do you intend to utilize that teacher as the door of liberation? And do you intend to walk through it? Do you intend to drink the nectar 
that is offered to you, no matter what transformation that nectar causes, do you intend to drink that nectar and never turn away from its potency in your own mind? That is the keeping of Samaya. Not prostrations, not standing up when the teacher comes in, not any kind of physical or demonstrative form of, of devotion. That's nothing. That's nothing. It's in the heart. And the student who truly practices is a student who practices internally, in the heart, deeply, drinking deeply of that nectar for the right reasons. From my point of view, as a teacher, I look for a student, when I look for a close student, I look for a student who is willing to change. I look for a student who understands the fault of cyclic existence and is willing to open their mind and change. A student who is unwilling to change is of no use to me. And if they really want to be students, generally I let them be students, but they have to do so in, almost in neutral, you know, until the point comes that they understand that something's got to give. <coughs> and I know for myself and any teacher that I've ever talked to, when a student demonstrates that, when they're ready to go with that, the teacher will snatch them right up and bring them close to their heart. And the bond then becomes unbreakable. But the bond, remember, is due to the practice of the student, due to the depth of understanding and the virtue in the student's mind. And everything about that the student has earned through their own effort. So that should be understood exactly in that way. That when one considers becoming a Buddhist, practicing the path, choosing a, a teacher, one should logically examine one's life. One should examine cyclic existence in general. One should examine the truth, the teaching of our own primordial wisdom nature. One should examine as well the logic of proceeding through the door of enlightenment. And from that point of view, through their own effort, really inner discipline, through their own examination, they should move forward. Thank you.